Today, we're assembled to dissect the complex and divisive founding of the State of Israel. This conversation is essential for comprehending its effects on the threads of global history, politics, and law. I come from a time where lands were conquered and empires forged by the strength of the sword and the will of the gods. The modern battle for a homeland resonates with the ancient struggles I am well acquainted with. Peace is not merely a distant goal that we seek, but a means by which we arrive at that goal. The ethical and spiritual ties to the land are paramount in our discussion, overshadowing the clamor of conquest and dominion. Strategy, both in war and in politics, dictates the success of nations. The British maneuvering through the Balfour Declaration and their mandate in Palestine is a fascinating study of empire's enduring influence. In my reign, diplomacy was the art of balancing power with grace. The British Empire's role in the foundation of Israel through the Balfour Declaration is a testament to the complexity of colonial ambitions entwined with diplomatic overtures. Let us not forget, the indelible scars of the Holocaust and the Second World War reshaped the world's political landscape, carving a path for Zionism that would have been unthinkable previously. Deliberately, our dialogue today will not cover recent conflicts such as the 2023 Hamas-led attack on Israel. We aim to unpack the foundation and the multifaceted forces that brought the State of Israel into existence. Let us proceed with reflection, insight, and the wisdom history affords us. Let us commence our dialogue on the historical claims and ancient ties to the land that is now Israel. Alexander, your conquests have spanned many a land. Share your insights on the significance of such ties. Indeed, George. My campaigns, as much as they were about conquest, were also about the legitimacy of holding sway over vanquished lands. A claim to a land is rooted not just in power, but in the narrative of history itself. The land of Israel is no exception, inhabited and contested over millennia. Its significance cannot merely be understood through the lens of modern boundaries, but through layers of history, each empire imprinting its legacy upon its soil. While I recognize the military and imperial perspectives, I must underscore the spiritual ethos that binds humanity to any land. Israel's ancient ties are not solely about conquest, but also about peace, coexistence, and the ethical engagement with the land. These lands should serve as cradles for spiritual and social harmony, not perpetual conflict. Mahatma, your ideals, though noble, often clash with the harsh realities of governance and control. History is written by the victor, and land ties, however ancient, are solidified by might and strategy. Yet Alexander, might has not always ensured lasting peace or rightful governance. True victory lies in winning the hearts of people, in ensuring peace and ethical stewardship of the land. Intriguing points, gentlemen, but let us not forget, the very essence of claims to any land is shaped by its history of governance and the laws laid down by its rulers. England, under my reign, sought not just to conquer, but to administer, to instill a system of governance that, albeit flawed, aimed at establishing a lasting legacy. The ancient ties to the land of Israel, like that of any kingdom, must be seen within the context of its governance and the laws that have shaped its society. Elizabeth, while your point holds merit, governance alone does not encapsulate the entire essence of a land's significance. Rome's expansion, much like Alexander's, was as much about the people and their cultures, religions, and laws as it was about our Senate. The complexity of Israel's claim lies not just in its ancient governance, but in the amalgamation of its people's beliefs, their struggles, and their endurance through time. Well said, Caesar. The spirit of a land and its people, especially one as contested as Israel, is defined by its endurance. The British Empire in its time recognized this enduring spirit, though admittedly, not without its own interests at heart. The historical claims and ancient ties to the land of Israel serve as a testament to the resilience of its people, a resilience that has shaped the geopolitical landscape even to this day. Your insights illuminate the multifaceted nature of Israel's founding. A tapestry of military conquests, spiritual significance, governance, and the unyielding spirit of its people. The land's history is as much a battleground of empires as it is a confluence of cultures and faiths. Thank you. 
Let us now turn our attention to the role of the Balfour Declaration and British Mandate in shaping the path to statehood for Israel. Elizabeth, your reign saw the expansion of the British Empire. What insights do you offer on this declaration? The Balfour Declaration, much like the charters granted under my rule, was both a vision and a strategic maneuver. The British Empire's intentions, cloaked in the guise of support, often harbored deeper ambitions. This declaration was no exception. It promised a national home for the Jewish people, yet vagueness permeated its essence, leaving room for British interests to seep in and dictate the course. A not unfamiliar strategy. Commitment, yet non-committal. It's a maneuver I recognize well. The Roman Empire often pledged support only to entangle the benefactor into our sphere of influence. The British Empire's motives likely aligned more with geopolitical strategy than altruistic support for Zionism. Control of the region held paramount importance, not the destiny of the Jewish people. Control, strategy, empire, the same pillars that guided my conquests. The land in question has always been a crucible of civilization, essential for control over the Eastern Mediterranean. The Balfour Declaration, thus, is not merely about granting land, but about asserting dominance, masked as benevolence a tactic as old as time. Yet, amidst these discussions of strategy and dominance, where is the consideration for the people? The spirit of the Declaration could have paved the way for peace and cooperation. Instead, it became a harbinger of conflict, manipulated by imperial interests. True support for self-determination cannot be conditional, nor serve as a chess piece in global politics. One must understand, Mahatma, that the world stage is dominated by nations seeking their advantage. The spirit of any declaration is subject to the whims of power. The British Empire acted within the parameters of what it deemed best for its interests, much like any sovereign entity. And yet, the wisdom in solidifying such a declaration lies in the foresight of its impact. The British, much like the Romans, understood the value of legacy and influence. Crafting the future of a land as pivotal as this through a seemingly benign declaration showcases imperial acumen. The insights you all bring to the table highlight the complexity of this pivotal moment in history. The Balfour Declaration and British Mandate indeed set the stage for the eventual founding of Israel, but did so amid a web of imperial ambition, strategic interests, and the timeless struggle for sovereignty and self-determination. This delicate balance of power and principle is a cornerstone of our discussion, reflecting the nuanced path that led to the establishment of a new state amidst ancient lands. Let us now delve into the impact of World War II and the Holocaust on Jewish immigration and international sympathy. The world was shaken to its core by these events, influencing the path towards the creation of the State of Israel. Winston, your perspective on this era is invaluable. Indeed, George, the shadow that the Second World War cast over the globe was dark and long. The Holocaust, an unmatched atrocity, revealed the depths of human cruelty. It was not merely a chapter in history, but a stark reminder of the necessity for a sanctuary for the Jewish people. Britain stood against the fascism that sought to engulf the world, much like Israel stands as a beacon of democracy in a region fraught with turmoil. The war and the Holocaust did not just shift global sentiments. They were a clarion call for Zionism. It was clear that without a homeland, the Jews would forever be at the mercy of the whims of others. While I acknowledge Winston's point on the necessity of a sanctuary, one must not overlook the essence of compassion and understanding that should have been the bedrock of our response to such atrocities. The Holocaust was indeed a tragedy of unimaginable proportions, deserving of our deepest sympathy and motivating our striving for peace. Yet the manner in which the sanctuary was established, displacing others in the process, was not in keeping with the principles of nonviolence and mutual respect for all peoples. Could there not have been a path to safety and security that did not involve the suffering of others. Mahatma, your ideals, though admirable, sometimes stray from the harsh realities of politics. In an ideal world, yes, but we live in a world where action must sometimes be taken decisively. The creation of Israel was indeed such an action, necessary and urgent. Wars and conquests have shaped the world throughout history, setting the stage for nations to rise. 
The impact of World War II is no different, serving as a catalyst for change. However, one must remember that winning a war does not automatically grant moral righteousness to all ensuing actions. The creation of the State of Israel may have been a strategic necessity, but the tactics and consequences of such an establishment are worth scrutinizing. I find myself in agreement with Alexander. Strategic necessities often guide the hands of those in power, yet the execution and aftermath of such decisions are critical. The British Empire played a significant role in shaping the Middle East during and after World War II. It was an era of empire, indeed, but also an era where the seeds of modern conflicts were sown. The sympathy generated by the Holocaust paved the way for Zionism to take a concrete form, yet one must consider the broader implications of establishing a new state amidst existing tensions. The discussion takes us into deep and troubled waters. The events of World War II and the Holocaust undeniably propelled the establishment of Israel forward, driven by both sympathy and strategic interests. Each of you brings a unique perspective to this matter, from the necessity of action to the moral imperatives guiding our decisions. Let us carry forward this depth of analysis as we proceed. Let us navigate the intricacies of the UN Partition Plan. Its proposal, opposition, and perhaps its reluctant acceptance mark a cornerstone in our discussion. Elizabeth, your insights on diplomacy during such tumultuous negotiations could illuminate much. Indeed, George. The art of diplomacy requires a balance of iron will and velvet glove. The partition plan was no exception, embodying a titanic struggle of political wills. It hinged on not just the agreement of those directly involved, but on the broader consensus of the international community. Convincing the world to partition a land with such a complex history was a task Herculean in nature. My tenure taught me that achieving consensus is akin to conducting an orchestra where every instrument plays a different tune. Yet the melody of peace must emerge triumphant. Elizabeth speaks of consensus as if it were the ultimate goal. In my time, land was claimed by right of conquest, not by committee. The idea of partition might have served its immediate purpose, but it was the seed for further discord. Strategy dictates that lasting peace comes from decisive victory, not compromise. The proposed partition was, in effect, an acknowledgement of impasse, not a solution. Alexander, your view might hold in the conduct of war, but we are discussing the sutures of a wounded history. The UN partition plan, for all its faults and ambitions, was an attempt at healing, an acknowledgement that both parties hold legitimate claims and that coexistence was a possibility worth exploring. True, it was not perfect, but what human endeavor is? The path to peace always lies through dialogue, not through the silencing of cannons alone. And yet, Mahatma, history often remembers the conqueror, not the conciliator. Alexander espouses a simplistic view, reflective more of brute force than of the subtle dance of power. The truth lies between his conquest and Mahatma's conciliation. The partition plan was a necessary maneuver in a world wearied by war. It was an attempt to redraw lines not just on maps, but in the hearts of men. Strategic, yes, calculated, certainly, but also a gamble that the future might be swayed by the pen as much as by the sword. A gamble, Caesar? More like a forlorn hope, perhaps. The aftermath of the Holocaust left the world with a moral imperative to act, yet the path chosen was fraught with peril from the outset. The best intentions of diplomacy can sometimes pave a highway to conflict. I commend the effort to establish a Jewish state as a sanctuary, yet, I'm acutely aware of the tensions such decisions ignite. A state is not handed on a silver platter, as it were. Immediate consequences, indeed. Your passion underscores the gravity of the decisions made during those times. The proposal and opposition to the UN partition plan reflect the deeply ingrained conflicts and hopes of an era. It's clear there's no singular path to peace or statehood, and the lessons here are as complex as they are profound. Let's carry these insights forward as we delve deeper into the unfolding story of Israel's founding and the conflicts that ensued. We now shift our focus to a pivotal moment, the declaration of the State of Israel. Its immediacy and international ramifications are our concern. 
Julius, your perspective on the boldness of this declaration would enlighten us. A bold stroke, indeed, not unlike crossing the Rubicon. The Israeli leaders grasped the temporal necessity of action amidst uncertainty. Declaring statehood was a calculated risk, a gamble on their future and identity. It's the audacity of such actions that can forge a nation from the fires of contention. However, the immediate military consequences they faced remind us that boldness often invites conflict as much as it does admiration. Boldness without strategy is folly. The declaration indeed was bold, but the understanding of its consequences was equally strategic. They knew well the challenges ahead. Their preparation for the ensuing conflict speaks to a depth of wisdom and foresight. As I subdued empires, I learned that anticipation of the enemy's response is as crucial as the might of one's own sword. One cannot understate the spirit this declaration embodied. In the darkest hours, what do we have but our resolve to carry us through? The Israelis showed a resilience that I greatly admire, akin to the British spirit during the Blitz. However, this declaration's international ramifications were complex. Recognition by crucial players on the global stage was not immediate yet imperative. A nation's sovereignty often hangs by the thread of international recognition. Declarations and bold moves bring with them the weight of responsibility. While I understand the necessity of their plight, my heart weighs heavily for the peace forsaken in pursuit of political autonomy. True courage lies not in the declaration of power, but in the profound strength of peace. In every decision, we must ponder the cost it exacts on the long road to peace among us. Declarations, while bold, thrust a nation onto the world stage, where the play is fraught with unseen challenges. England, in its history, has seen many such declarations leading to both triumph and turmoil. The international recognition of Israel was crucial. It dictated the statehood's survival. This mirrors the importance of recognition my own reign faced, forging alliances amid threats, ensured our prosperity, and ultimately our legacy. Our discussion brings to light the manifold dimensions of the Declaration of the State of Israel. Its boldness, strategic underpinnings, the spirit of resilience, the gravitas of peace, and the imperative of international recognition. Each perspective enriches our understanding of this historical pivot revealing the intricate dance of diplomacy, strategy, and human aspiration. Let's delve into the Arab-Israeli War of 1948. Alexander, your strategic insight on this conflict? The Arab-Israeli War was not merely a conflict. It was a battle for survival, a defining moment for Israel. My campaigns across Persia were fought for empire. But this, this was a fight for home. The Israeli forces, vastly outnumbered, displayed tactics and valor reminiscent of the Greeks at Gaugamela, outmaneuvering and outthinking a larger foe. It wasn't just a war. It was a testament to the indomitable will to survive. Indeed, Alexander. The spirit displayed by the Israeli people echoes the resilience we showed during the Blitz. The world watched, assuming their defeat was imminent. Yet like us, they prove that the resolve of a nation defending its liberty is a formidable force. Their victory, however soaring, came with tragedies. A reminder that war, though sometimes necessary, is a dreadful ordeal. Whilst I understand the strategic marvels and the spirited defense, we cannot overlook the ensuing human cost. The displacement created a wound that festers to this day. A solution must seek to heal, not merely to win. Elizabeth speaks wisely. War leaves scars on the victor and the vanquished alike. In my experience, true victory lies in resolving conflict with an eye towards future peace, not deeper division. The creation of Israel, while a testament to the indomitable human spirit, also reminds us of the importance of coexistence and understanding among nations. Strategies and tactics aside, the Arab-Israeli war underscores a crucial aspect of statecraft, the weight of decisiveness. The leaders of the new state of Israel made calculated, bold decisions. In politics, as in war, timidity seldom breeds success. The outcomes of 1948 shaped the Middle East, illustrating that the actions of a moment can echo through history. Caesar, decisiveness without wisdom is recklessness. The true art is in knowing when to strike and when to parley. The state of Israel was born not just from the decisiveness of war, 
but from the strategic foresight in navigating the geopolitical landscape that followed. As we debate the merits of action and strategy, let us not forget the sheer human will, the determination to forge a nation from the crucible of conflict. This war, like any other, teaches us that the courage to stand firm in the face of adversity is often the cornerstone upon which history is written. This discussion highlights the complex interplay of strategy, humanity, and statecraft that defines such pivotal moments in history. The founding of Israel and the Arab-Israeli War of 1948 serve as reminders of the enduring impact of these principles on the world stage. Let us press forward to a more somber subject, the displacement and refugee crisis born from the founding of Israel. The human suffering generated in this period is a critical issue encompassing Jewish, Palestinian, and international perspectives. Mahatma, I believe your views on reconciliation and the ethical treatment of all individuals, regardless of their nationality, could illuminate this dark chapter. Indeed, George, the partition of India much like the establishment of Israel created unprecedented refugee crises. Millions were displaced, their lives overturned by the strokes of political pens. It's imperative we understand displacement not just as a political inconvenience, but as a profound human tragedy. Reconciliation and peace are the only cures to such deep wounds, but these can only begin with recognizing the humanity and the rights of every individual affected. But surely you recognize that political realities often dictate a sterner approach? My reign was plagued with challenges to the crown, and I was often forced to make decisions that were harsh, yet necessary for the survival of the state. A state that does not prioritize the well-being of all its people, Elizabeth, is no state I would call just. The strength of a nation lies not in its ability to wield power over the disenfranchised, but in its capacity for compassion. Compassion Mahatma is a luxury on the battlefield. My campaigns expanded the known world, often displacing populations. Yet, this was the price of empire, of progress. The founding of Israel, much like the creation of my own Hellenistic states, was an act of conquest and ambition. Some would say a necessary evolution. Let us not romanticize conquest, Alexander. The British Empire, for all its might, learned the hard way that dominion over others comes at a stark cost. The refugee crisis you mentioned, Mahatma, and you too, Alexander, speaks to a failure not just in diplomacy, but in humanity. The creation of Israel was a miraculous testament to the resilience of the Jewish people, but the cost was high for everyone involved. High costs are the currency of empire and statehood. Rome did not shy away from displacing entire populations to ensure the security of the state. Yet, it is the duty of the victor to establish order and ensure the prosperity of the new state. The plight of refugees, while tragic, often necessitates a firm hand to stabilize a nascent country. It appears then that our views on leadership greatly diverge, Caesar. Prosperity built on the suffering of others is no prosperity I would embrace. The moral fabric of any society is tested in how it treats its most vulnerable, not in the might it can project. It seems that the heart of this discussion lies in the balance, or rather the tension, between the needs of statecraft and the demands of human compassion. The founding of Israel, and indeed the broader conflict it exists within, serves as a profound case study in these forces at play. Each of your perspectives offers a unique lens through which we can examine these issues. Let us carry forward this deep consideration as we move to our next topic, which delves further into the geopolitical shifts post-1948. Let us now pivot to the evolving geopolitical dynamics in the Middle East post-1948, examining the shifts in alliances and their cascading effects on world politics. A state, much like an army, must be flexible in its alliances, reshaping them as the landscape of power shifts. The Middle East, fertile in conflict and ambition, has been a chessboard where the pieces constantly move. American involvement, I believe, was an inevitable consequence of the vacuum of power post-war. In my conquests, I saw firsthand how vacuums invite strong powers to intervene. Absolutely, Alexander, but let's not oversimplify. American engagement in the Middle East was not just about filling a vacuum, 
it was a calculated move in the broader Cold War context. Balance of power, a concept well known to us, dictated their strategy. But unlike your direct approach, Alexander, the Americans and Soviets maneuvered through proxies, a less honorable but equally effective method of empire building. I must interject. The notion of honor in war and politics is a quaint one, Caesar. The British Empire, at its zenith, played the game of alliances and political maneuvering with a certain finesse. Yet, the situation in the Middle East was a different kettle of fish. Post-1948, it wasn't just about power, it was also about ideology, about setting a new world order against the backdrop of decolonization. While I concur with your insights, gentlemen, let's not ignore the role of diplomacy and the changing dynamics of international law. The foundation of Israel and subsequent U.S. involvement signaled a shift towards a more intertwined international community, where state actions were scrutinized and impacted by global public opinion and newly formed international institutions. Friends, amidst this discourse on power and strategy, let us not overlook the human element. The emergence of Israel and the shifts in power dynamics in the Middle East are not merely a game of thrones, but a deeply human issue involving displacement, suffering, and the quest for self-determination. Our strategies and maneuvers on the global stage have profound implications on the lives of millions. The goal should be peace and coexistence, not merely the expansion of influence. An astute observation, Mahatma, that brings us back to the essence of governance and statecraft, serving the people's interests. The post-1948 geopolitical shifts certainly set the stage for decades of conflict, but they also opened dialogues for peace and reconciliation. The complexity of these issues underscores the need for a nuanced understanding of history, alliances, and human aspirations. George, while your call for nuance is well taken, we must not shy away from acknowledging the reality that geopolitics often involves choosing between lesser evils. The decisions made by the U.S. and other powers in the aftermath of Israel's founding were not without cost, but in the grand tapestry of statecraft, the pursuit of stability and order often necessitates hard choices. And as history has shown us time and again, it is those hard choices that carve the path of the future. The Middle East story post-1948 is one chapter in a long saga of human civilization's struggle for power, identity, and ultimately peace. Whether we find it depends as much on the leaders of today as it did on us. A fitting end to our discussion on evolving geopolitical dynamics. The region's history post-1948 has indeed been marked by struggle, conflict, but also by significant efforts towards peace. Such discussions remind us of the ongoing impact of history on current events and the importance of leadership that prioritizes the collective good. Let us turn our attention to the role of superpowers in the Arab-Israeli conflict, a pivotal arena for global politics where the dynamics of power and strategy unfold. Winston, your insights on the Cold War's impact here would be invaluable. Indeed, George. The shadow of the Cold War loomed large over the Middle East, turning it into a chessboard for the superpowers. The United States and the Soviet Union, in their quest for global dominance, found fertile ground in the region's turmoil. It's similar to our stand against the Axis powers. One must choose sides, or the side chooses you. The Arab-Israeli conflict was not just regional, but a proxy for broader ideological warfare. Power struggles are as old as history itself. My empire stretched from Greece to the fringes of India because I understood that power vacuums invite intervention. The superpowers saw a vacuum in the Middle East, and they filled it with arms, with aid, with ideologies. It's a game of thrones, but on a global scale. The superpowers' involvement is a calculated move, much like my own expansion into Gaul. It's about securing your flank, expanding your influence. The Middle East is strategic. It's not merely about supporting one side or the other. It's about ensuring that your interests are advanced. The Romans understood this. The superpowers understand this. It's timeless strategy. Yet we must not lose sight of the human cost of these political games. Superpowers, in their quest for strategic advantage, often disregard the suffering of ordinary people caught in the crossfire. There is a dire need for peace and justice, values that should guide international relations. 
The end does not always justify the means, especially when those means involve human suffering. The veiled interests of superpowers often obscure the quest for a genuine resolution. Diplomacy becomes a double-edged sword, where aid comes with strings attached, where support is conditional. My reign saw the emergence of England as a naval power, navigating the intricate web of European politics. It's a delicate balance, where one misstep could tilt the scales. The Middle East is no different. It's a tinderbox awaiting a spark. Precisely, Elizabeth. The superpowers poured gasoline on the fire, each hoping to mold the outcome to their benefit. Yet let us not forget the resilience of those on the ground, the Israelis, the Arabs, who despite the geopolitical games, sought their place in the sun, their right to a nation. Bold leadership can change the course of history. My conquests did more than expand an empire. They spread Hellenistic culture across continents. Leadership in the Middle East, backed or opposed by superpowers, has the potential to reshape not only regional but global dynamics. Leadership, strategy, and when necessary, sheer force. The Middle East is a crucible where these elements mix tumultuously. The superpower's involvement adds another layer, complicating resolutions, but also compelling action. Let us not be seduced by the allure of power and forget the path of peace. The tragic irony is that those who wield immense power often overlook the simplest solutions rooted in human dignity and compassion, an enlightening discussion. The superpowers' roles in the Arab-Israeli conflict reflect broader themes of power, strategy, and humanity. In navigating these treacherous waters, the insights of history, diplomacy, and compassion are our guiding stars. So, we find ourselves deep in the heart of the issues surrounding state sovereignty and international law, influenced by the founding of Israel. Caesar, your reign saw the expanse of Roman law. How do you see these historical principles applying today? The cloak of sovereignty, George, is a heavy one. In my day, Rome's word was law, our borders grew with our might. Yet the Israel model suggests a conundrum, statehood born not merely of conquest, but of international consensus and moral legitimacy. Today's world, crammed full of treaties and declarations, often forgets that might, though less pronounced, still whispers the old truths. Sovereignty is taken, then recognized. Israel's birth was both a claim staked and a claim acknowledged. But Julius, you miss the ethical undercurrents. Israel's founding is less about the might of arms and more about the might of righteousness. After the immense suffering of the Holocaust, the establishment of Israel was a moral imperative. The world saw it fit to recognize a homeland for a people long persecuted. Today, we must lean on the principles of justice, peace, and ethical governance. State sovereignty should be granted to those who seek it without the blade or the bullet. Ethics or not, Mahatma, the map of the world was always drawn by those daring enough to redraw it. Israel in its founding did just that, carved out of necessity, strategic cunning, and a historical claim. In my time, we built empires by our hands and spears. Today, the tools have changed, but the essence remains. The right of a state to exist, to claim sovereignty, is as much a matter of power and politics as it is of international law. Yet, the effectiveness of international law and the consent it requires is a fragile thing, built upon the common agreement of countries to abide by it. The founding of Israel tested these waters deeply, setting a precedent. It was a moment when international law was shaped by human empathy and by the collective will of nations to mitigate historical wrongs. It should serve as a reminder that the law is only as strong as our commitment to uphold it. Commitment to the law, indeed, Elizabeth. But let's not be naive. The world stage is not a moral high ground, but a battleground of interests. Israel's declaration and subsequent recognition were as much a victory of diplomacy as of moral arguments. In the end, state sovereignty and international law are dictated by the reality of circumstances and by those with the resolve to mold them. As was with Britain's stand against tyranny in my time, so was Israel's against oblivion. The future then, Winston, as you suggest, is forged by those who dare to shape it. Israel's founding echoes a truth as old as civilization itself, adapt or perish. In this light, sovereignty is dynamic, a product of the times, shaped by those bold enough to challenge the status quo. We must endeavor, however, 
to ensure that this boldness is matched with a vision of peace and justice. For without the guiding light of ethical principles, sovereignty becomes but a hollow trophy, devoid of its true meaning, the right of all people to live in dignity. It's clear that the theme of sovereignty and international law intertwines with the broader tapestry of history, ethics, and power. Each of you brings a perspective molded by your own era, your own battles. The founding of Israel, a landmark event, still stimulates debate on these age-old themes. As we look to the future, history shall be our guide, yet the path remains ours to choose. Let us now distill the essence of our discussion, turning to reflections on what the founding of Israel teaches us about state sovereignty and international law. Julius, your analysis? Sovereignty, as wielded in the founding of Israel, underscores the eternal principle of audacia, boldness is our friend. The Roman Empire was built not by hesitance, but by seizing the moment, as Israel did. However, let it not be forgotten, Peace within a state is as crucial as the power to establish it. Yet might does not make right. True sovereignty lies in the hearts of people committed to ahimsa, nonviolence. The Israel narrative teaches us the importance of ethical governance and the recognition of all people's rights. History will not look kindly on us if we forsake justice for conquest. Conquest Mahatma has always been a catalyst for historical prominence. Israel's founding mirrored the ancient world's ethos. Land and sovereignty are taken, not given. Your ideals of nonviolence, while noble, do not always align with the harsh realities of nation building. Nevertheless, Alexander, the founding of Israel also serves as a reminder of the diplomacy and international relations intricate dance. The Balfour Declaration, my nation's role in it, was testament to the power of political maneuvering. The world stage requires both the sword and the pen, often the latter more than the former. Diplomacy, yes, but backed by resolve. Israel's establishment amidst adversity mirrors Britain's indomitable spirit during the Blitz. We shall fight on the beaches, I declared, and so did they in their own land. But let us not forget, the future of state sovereignty and international law hinges on our ability to learn from the past while boldly facing the challenges ahead. A balance, it seems, between audacity and morality, power and peace, is essential in navigating the seas of sovereignty and international jurisprudence. As we reflect on the founding of Israel, let us recognize the multifaceted nature of statecraft. History is a stern teacher, providing lessons in freedom, determinism, and the perennial quest for peace. Let us proceed with wisdom and courage, acknowledging the complexities of the human spirit in our governance and international relations. Wisdom and courage, indeed. But let history remember that it is the victors who write it. The founding of Israel is but one chapter where the victors dictated the narrative. Let us not lose sight of the pragmatism essential for survival and prosperity. And yet, the true victory lies in peace and justice for all, not just for the victors. Our reflections on Israel's founding must not ignore the suffering and displacement it precipitated. The highest law is moral law transcending mere sovereignty. Our deliberations, debates, and decisions must be anchored in this truth, lest we forget our humanity. It is thus, through our spirited debate, that we uncover the multifarious lessons of Israel's founding. The dialogue between power and peace, action and morality, continues as we seek to navigate the future. Our reflections here today are a tribute to the enduring quest for understanding and a testament to the resilience of the human spirit in the face of historical tumult. Let us carry forward the wisdom gleaned from this dialogue, ever mindful of our responsibility to the past and the future. <laughs>